Well, good morning. My name is Jason Smith. I have the awesome privilege of being the pastor here of First Baptist. What an awesome morning it's already been in terms of uh, baby dedication and baptisms, uh, singing, worshiping together, and now we get to open God's word. Amen? All right, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 2 as we continue our walk through the Scripture. As we continue our walk through the Scripture, if you do not have a Bible, there is a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that as a gift from us to you. You can keep that so that you can have a copy of God's Word. When I was in junior high, I was really good at math. It just came naturally to me. Uh, And one day my teacher asked me if I would become her teacher's aide. Now I told her I had to think about this. And that afternoon as I walked home from school, I told my friends about it. And they didn't think it was that great of an idea. Man, Miss Thornton is too strict. You can't be on her side. The next one said, you don't want to be known as the teacher's pet. This isn't cool at all. You need to sit in the back and crack jokes with us. So the next day I went up to her and I declined. But I think she kind of sensed that uh, my friend's perspective was overshadowing me. So she began, Jason, I need your gifts in math to help tutor other students, to help me quickly grade papers and tests. Coming underneath my authority is a good thing. I need you to lead and not simply goof off. Now, in that moment, I had a choice to make between two perspectives, okay? What was cool in my friend's eyes or my teacher? Now, in a similar way this morning, church, we come across a biblical text that the culture says is way un cool, right? It should be thrown off and ignored. For our culture, gender is fiction. One can simply choose gender based on personal feelings. And most certainly, there are no role distinctions between men and women. How archaic. But the Bible stands against our gender-confused culture, And it insists that gender is actually a God-given fact, that the identity of every human is gender-specific, given as God's image bearers. And it should come as no surprise that God gives and sometimes has specific instructions for men and women, especially in the church, his household. So whose perspective are we going to listen to? All right, will we follow what's cool, and be persuaded by the fear of man? Or will we allow God, our Savior, the authority to instruct us how we can do church? With that, let me read for us uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. I'm going to read 8 through 15. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women making a claim to godliness." And a woman must learn quietly with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be persevered through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity, and sanctity with self-restraint. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Father, we have come this morning to your word to learn from you. 
Father, you created us and you saved us. You have given us your son and we trust you. And so we ask for you to give us wisdom and understanding and to to teach us so that we would understand your ways and how you have created us so that we might walk worthy of you, so that we as a church might uphold your truth to a culture that is so confused and needs to see the truth of who you are because you love us and you have given your son for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, there it is. Half of you, your blood pressure has shot up. (laughs) While the other half of you are on the edge of your seat because uh, you want to see the preacher squirm for 30 minutes. (laughs) Well, the good news for that second group is there was far too much content as I waded through this text for me to even finish it in one week. Believe me, I tried. Is there any way we can get this in one week? Nope. All right, so this is going to be a two-part sermon. As you can imagine, there's a lot to debate about this text, and it needs lots of explanation. So with that, let me begin by grounding our passage in the context of the letter. That's a good thing to do, right? Recall where we were last week, because Paul is writing a letter, and he's not randomly just changing topics here. Okay, Paul was urging the church to be about the business of prayer. Remember last week, praying for the lost, that you and I, as God's own children, come before the throne of God, the heavenly temple. We enter in the name of Jesus, covered by his blood. And Jesus says, that one is mine. And last week, Paul urged us in that context for you and I to speak the name of our lost friends and family members to cry out on their behalf that they might be saved. Because God desires all men to be saved. And there is one mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus, who died for the atonement for all. And that's where we were. Remember, Christianity at its widest, come one, come all. Christianity at its most narrow, there is one mediator, Christ Jesus. And you must come to him. So it's within that call to corporate prayer of what we must be about as a church that Paul begins to give correction. Remember the thesis of the letter. That is that the gospel is outward. The, uh, the false teachers were trying to make it inward. No, no, no. The gospel is outward, but also inside the church We must be a godly example of truth to the world. The world is going to say, where can we find truth? And truth is actually being upheld, a pillar by the church. Okay, That's the thesis for his entire letter. So Paul begins to correct. Now, no one likes to be corrected, right? No one likes to be corrected. I mean, it was kind of fun when Paul was correcting the false teachers, but that's just because it's someone else. Now he addresses the whole church in Ephesus, okay, with a much broader brush. He addresses men and women specifically. And I promise you that that brush is wide enough to address all of us in our day. Verse 8, Paul writes, Therefore I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Now apparently it had been reported back to Paul that instead of leading in prayer for the lost, the men spent their time at church quarreling. You see, where there is continual fighting, 
one thing is certain, pride is on the throne. The men were more worried about being right, and everyone needs to know it, than bringing their loved one's name before their heavenly Father, that they might be saved. And indeed, I guess it got intense, because Paul now charges them to pray without wrath. It's helpful, Paul's instructions here uh, to Philippians. Listen to Philippians 2. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, lay down your own personal rights and begin to think about others. See, the false teachers were creating controversies around French theology, and there was constant friction amongst the men. We can easily say that they were spending more of their time exercising their right to free speech and almost no time praying for the lost. And Paul calls them to account for it. And I said this last week, but it's worth repeating. How much time do you spend complaining about politics versus praying? And how much, do you time, how much time do you spend chasing fringe theological rabbits versus actually witnessing to someone? When we examine our spiritual disciplines, are we all talk and no prayer? Next, Paul's rebuke takes aim at the ladies of the church. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. Now, apparently, it had also been reported that the ladies were showing up to church much too concerned about making a fashionable impression and were little concerned about actually being godly. Now here it helps to know a little bit about the Hellenistic world and ancient Ephesus. Because at this time, elaborately braided hair was a sign of extravagant wealth. Women often, often wore their hair in enormously uh, elaborate arrangement with braids and curls piled up and included decorating it with gems, gold, or pearls. All right, so you got to think of prom on steroids. <laughs> Later, Paul in 5.6 will warn the ladies to not be self-indulgent. Excessive adornment was not only characteristic of the wealthy, but also ladies of the night. Remember, too, that Ephesus was home of the temple of the goddess uh, Artemis and all the temple prostitution that went along with that. You see, Paul's rebuke is actually simple to understand in principle, right? A Christian woman striving for godliness should dress modestly and respectable and not like the provocative culture. Paul is not creating legalistic rules, like that a woman cannot ever braid her hair, or she must have no style, all right? You guys need to wear, uh, you know, brown paper sacks to church. No, he's simply saying that she should not flaunt wealth or sexuality. Rather, she should find her beauty in being godly and pleasing to the Lord, her, that her character is of good works, not whether her fashion keeps up with New York City's runways. Don't you understand how fleeting clothes and hair and even outward beauty is? John Christensen uh, once considered the golden-tongued bishop of Constantinople, was regarded as the best preacher of his times, that is, until he preached this text. 
and said something along the lines of what I've said this morning, preaching about flaunting wealth and sexuality. And in response, uh, Empress Eudoxia ran Christendom out of town, never to return, and he died in exile. Let us not repeat history. It's something, I, it's something I say to my kids all the time. It is not a virtue to be easily offended. In fact, the Bible teaches the opposite, that we should have a teachable, correctable spirit. So remember again the context. Paul is urging the church, guys, we must be about praying. We have the privilege of going before God Almighty. But instead, when the saints gather, it's turned into a prom fashion show. The men are worried about winning contentious debates, and the women are evil-eyeing each other. And no one is worried about praying for the lost, distracted by petty, temporary things. The fact that we have the awesome privilege that we are the temple of the living God. You you understand the Bible was written in progressive revelation on purpose, that God used to dwell in a tabernacle and then in a temple in Jerusalem, but now God dwells within his people when we gather together to be able to go before the throne of God Almighty, we cannot trade that high calling for grade school antics. And now Paul shifts his discussion from beauty to behavior. Verse 11, a woman must learn quietly with entire submissiveness. Now what's crazy is that when we read this, we do not understand that this New Testament statement actually shattered conventional stereotypes in the ancient world, but in the opposite direction. Women in the ancient world did not learn in the same academic setting as men. They were considered intellectually inferior Educating women was thought to be a big waste of time. But here, Paul says, let women learn. The New Testament has been the most effective force in all of history for lifting women to levels of respect, dignity, and freedom. And although the church has not always lived up to the Bible standards for what women are, This is an undeniable fact. Everywhere that Christianity has taken root, the status of women improves dramatically. Because the Bible shatters sexist ideas that women are intellectually inferior. You have to look no further than the Gospels. Do you remember in Luke chapter 10, the story of Mary and Martha? And Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet learning and listening to him. But Martha is busy hosting and cleaning the house, and she gets angry at her sister Mary because she's sitting and listening instead of helping her cleaning. Now, you know what our modern ears do not pick up when we read that account? How radical it was that Mary sits in a personal seminary class with Rabbi Jesus. God does not consider women inferior, nor does the Bible teach that women are inferior, but that God made man and woman equally in his image. Now let's talk about the term quietly. This does not mean to not speak Like, hey, just keep your mouth shut. 
Rather, this infers to a gentle demeanor. It's the exact same term, word, used earlier in, in the same section, 2-2, whenever Paul says that we would uh, pray that kings would allow us to lead a peaceful and quiet life, okay? A scene in Acts 22 will help me illustrate this. When Paul returned to Jerusalem, because the Spirit was calling him after his third missionary journey, you must go back to Jerusalem. He said, and bonds and affliction await you. And Paul got to Jerusalem. He was there several days uh, completing a vow. And, and the Pharisees, the Jews, recognized him and they come to rush him. Okay? They intend to stone and kill him on the spot. And there's a big ruckus. He gets roughed up a little bit. But the Roman guards step in and stop them from killing Paul. And they are carrying Paul off. And uh, Paul stops the Roman guard and asks, waves his hand and asks if he could address the crowd. Okay? Now, um, in uh, 22 verse 40, it says that a great hush came over the crowd. They became quiet. But then Paul speaks to them in Hebrew. And that shocks the crowd, surprises them. And then in 22 verse 2, it says, they, uh, we translate it, they became even more quiet. That second word that is used there is the same word here in 1 Timothy 2.11. Not meaning keep silent, but a word for being respectful and listening now with the intent to learn. You hear what I'm saying? A woman must learn quietly with all submissiveness. Now, culture has taken twisted aim at this word submission, requiring me to plead with you this morning to please set aside the perspective of God's critics and listen with a teachable spirit. Submission to proper godly authority is always a good thing. Amen. Jesus the Son submitted to God the Father, equal in essence, but a different function within the Godhead himself. Jesus the Son submitted to God the Father. At the root of all of our submission as Christians is submission unto God. Christ. You understand that? Every one of us as Christians are in one way or another required to submit. Submission unto Christ. Now, the submission that's being highlighted here is in the context of when the church gathers and the pastors preach with biblical authority. For the record, the submission to authoritative pastoral teaching is required of everyone within the church, males included. See 1 Corinthians 16, 16 or Hebrews 13, 17. That is that when we gather together to hear the authoritative word of God, and I or any other pastor assumes the role of teaching us, every one of us is required to have a teachable, willing, submissive spirit. Now let me point out that there are two times specifically that a woman is charged with submissiveness. That is in this setting that I just described and a wife towards her husband. Scripture is not calling all women in general to submit to all men in general. Give me an amen on that, yeah. <laughs> and as we will see next week, God desires that the order of creation to be reflected in the home 
and in the church, his body. Husbands are called to lay down their lives for their wives the way that Christ did for his church. And pastors in the church are called to shepherd the way the good shepherd leads, with great patience and gentleness. Christian headship is always associated with servant sacrificial leadership. One cannot say submit without simultaneously saying love like Christ. You understand that? Submission to proper godly authority is always a good thing. But God never calls a woman to make peace with sin. Abusive, domineering, tyrannical headship is sin. And God never calls any of us to make peace with sin. And Christians have a responsibility never to allow the idea of submission to become a justification for abuse. That is our responsibility to model and display proper headship and to never allow it to be even remotely associated with abuse. But just because there is abuse of authority does not erase the the reality that God has ordained authority. God has ordained authority and in cases there's abuse of authority that we should address and deal with, but it doesn't remove the reality. So ladies, let me speak to you directly. What is the greatest picture of submission in the entire Bible? It's Jesus going to the cross. It's Jesus kneeling in the garden. So overcome with emotion because he knows what is coming that he sweats blood. And cries out, Father, is there any other way? I do not want to go to the cross. I do not want to become sin. I do not want to become forsaken by you. Yet not my will, but your will be done. The greatest act of submission, which resulted in salvation, resurrection, eternal life, victory over sin and death and the grave. So ladies, in these two perspectives, two areas, you are called to paint the picture of the gospel by leading in godly submission. In a culture of independence and rebellious pride, your conduct is a sign pointing to the ultimate submission, Jesus and his salvation and salvation that is in his name. It is a sign pointing to the gospel. That is a special charge that has been given unto you. My best friend from seminary a few years ago took his family with three boys to Washington, D.C., Now, it's relevant for this story that you know that he is black, and he greatly anticipated taking his three young boys to the MLK Memorial. 
Now, if you haven't seen it, I want you to see a picture of this memorial. It is, it is a brilliant piece. It is moving. What you're looking at, you see the giant mountain. There is a sign that reads, out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. Okay? And so my buddies, in anticipation, having studied a lot about the civil rights movement and all that Martin Luther King did, he has great anticipation and, and he knows what this monument represents. He's going to take his family and his three boys there. When they get there, his three boys start climbing all over the monument like it's a climbing wall. Right? You've done this before as parents. You have so much built up in your mind about, this is going to be a great teaching lesson. It's going to be awesome. They're going to get it. It's going to go deep into their soul. They need to know this. And they're just climbing all over it like it's a climbing wall. Beloved, the world will not always understand the beauty and magnitude how our submission is a sign that points to the magnificence of Christ's submission in the gospel. But that in no way lessens the splendor or importance of it. May we as a people find that it is enough for our lives to point to the gospel of Jesus. May we be teachable and humble. May we not be distracted with trivial, prideful things, but rather may we be diligent in the work of prayer. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, again, we declare how much we trust you in your word that you have given your son for us. There is no God like you. Your ways are not our ways. You are holy in all of your ways. You dwell in unapproachable light. But your word says you would rather be known by your mercy and your grace than your wrath and your power. I praise you for that. That you save, that you have entered in and you have redeemed us yourself. So, Father, this morning as we receive correction from your word and as we contemplate even the incredible submission within the Godhead, the Son to the Father, and the way that you created mankind, Father, help us to realize that knowing and understanding you is all the affirmation that we need. Your approval is more than enough. And you always desire good things for us. Your instructions are never for our harm, always for our good. We believe that. We trust that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church family, the praise team is going to come lead us in one final song, and that is a chance for us to respond. 
I can't tell you what that looks like this morning. I know that we had an incredible morning together with, with parents dedicating their children. You may need a time of, of prayer as you think about continuing to lead your family and praying over your kids. We had baptisms where it's the picture of salvation, it's the picture of Jesus Christ saving us, making us clean and new. And you may be here this morning and, and say, I have never placed my faith in Jesus Christ. If that is you, guess what? Today is the day of salvation. Cry out to him. Our God is near. We have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you if you want to use these steps or the stage as an altar. But we as a church, we continue to worship and we continue to cry out. Please respond in however God has prompted you this morning. Would you stand?